right, this afternoon we're going to learn a little bit about Darknet Opset, OPSEC. Pretty interesting talk. Please welcome our first time at DEF CON and first time speaker, Sam Bent. Cheers. Thank you. It's great to be here. I never thought I'd be up on this stage. Um, so my talk is about Darknet OPSEC um, from the point of view of myself, um, some of the precautions, some of the things that I did as a Darknet vendor to try to keep myself safe from the federal government and other adversaries that existed out there. So these are my aliases. Um, I have a couple of them. Um, my day job uh, involves me writing documentation, um, pretty dry stuff, but I enjoy doing it. Um, while my night job, I'm a prison advocate. So uh, I do a lot of outreach work and try to help people and guide people through the myriad um, that is the federal prison system, whether it's them going into it or their family members going into it. I have about 54 slides, so I'm gonna have to move pretty quick once I start. So I've worked not only as a darknet vendor, but also worked on multiple darknet markets, um, done PR work for them, um, as well as resolved disputes for customers, things like that. My objective with this talk is to give a different perspective than typically what's given at conferences or on the mainstream media um, from someone who's actually been there, uh, not just studied it from a distance or speculated on it. So there are a lot of similarities between the darknet subculture and the hacking subculture. Um, both of them typically involve some kind of paranoia and a lot of times that paranoia is there for a reason. Um, both uh, very much value their anonymity, um, secrecy, uh, intellectual dominance, especially in the hacking realm uh, or in the hacking scene. But also there's a bit of a learning curve to each. Um, I would argue that the hacking scene has a much greater learning curve than the dark net, uh, especially because in order to be a hacker, you don't just start up tour. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, depending on what you're doing. So the paths between being a hacker and a dark net vendor can differentiate too. Um, as a hacker, you start off really with no adversaries whatsoever. Um, you don't have anyone that's out to get you. Um, you know, when you hop on IRC for the first time, um, you can learn almost everything as far as the process goes for a pen test inside of things like the pen test standard. A lot of what we do is open source at this point. You can watch a DEFCON talk and learn a lot about what it is that hackers do um, or the culture or just be here in this room, come to DEF CON. Um, that doesn't exist in the dark net. Um, you can't you know, just hop on and watch a YouTube video and learn about darknet subculture. It's something that you have to hop on the darknet and you have to explore and learn and meet people um, and hopefully be safe in doing it. Uh, the sources for information are completely different. Um, for me, my, my favorite always was as a darknet vendor, um, darknet news sites, dark fail um, is one that's been around for quite a while um, and is pretty good. Dread is a forum that's one of the most active on the dark net from what I've seen. So there's a book that Kevin Mitnick wrote called Ghosts in the Wires. Um, and I took his approach when looking at operational security from that, specifically the part where he called up law enforcement and social engineered them to allow him to use the NCIS system that they have. Um, I feel that a lot of the information that you could want or would be relevant um, is located in manuals. Um, and if we know how law enforcement operates, um, we're trying to be criminals, then we know what they're going to do next. It's like having a cheat sheet. Um, so with that, 
Um, I ended up going and looking and finding United States Postal Inspector's manual to see what he classified as a suspicious package. Um, I needed to know that if I was going to be shipping narcotics through the United States mail. So this information's out there. This is not it, but this is an example uh, of some of the things that you would look at when evaluating things like this. Um, it'd be an eclectic process where you take what's valuable and leave what's not. Some of the things that would raise suspicion when you're trying to move drugs through the United States mail system would be using too much tape, handwriting the labels. Uh, if you don't use the official USPS boxes, um, fake names on recipients or return addresses, all of these things add up as red flags that ultimately leads to a United States postal inspector possibly applying for a search warrant for a box. So in order to avoid these, you just don't do those things. It's pretty straightforward. It's like reverse engineering law enforcement to some degree. Um, for me, I had a moral dilemma when I wanted to ship drugs, which is kind of ironic. Uh, I didn't want to send, say, cocaine uh, from some random person's address. Um, you know, there's a lot of hardworking people in the world. And to me, sending out four ounces of blow to some guy who's a construction worker and just trying to make ends meet and have DHS break through his door really wasn't uh, the best way to go about it. And I was, I was sure that somewhere there existed a database of people that I considered personally um, to be people okay to screw over. <laughs> so I searched for it. And I tried to figure out what that database would be, how it would look, and how I would be able to access it. And the only solution that I could come up with was this. <laughs> so remember, I said you need to have a valid return address. It needs to be the correct name. Um, it needs to be the correct address. All of these had that. Um, so they qualified and they made them real. And if it got sent back to them or if they got raided, I didn't really have any qualms in that. And um, it was interesting because the Department of Homeland Security special agent um, that was in charge when they ended up raiding me felt the exact same way this crowd feels. Um, he laughed about it too, he thought it was hilarious. <laughs> so I, when I ship, um, the thing that I came to my conclusion was, you can pick, obviously you have a ton of different services that you can use to ship anything nowadays. Um, my favorite by far is the United States Postal Service. Um, and there's a f few reasons for that. Uh, private, pa private services like DHL or UPS, they can open up your package whenever they want. Uh, there's no rules in that they're a private corporation. Um, but a warrant is required for, your, the U, for USPS to be able to open something. Um, they also have more locations than anyone else um, and they can get to your door from door to door in three days, which is great, uh, especially if you're going for good reviews on the dark net, you know? Um, <laughs> So it's, it's run by the federal government, which is kind of, you know, it's kind of an ironic thing that the people that are hunting you, you know, a branch of their system is going to be enabling you to traffic drugs on a national or an international level. Um, it's kind of, I, I guess you'd say like a spiteful thing uh, to do um, where you're, you're having the feds send your drugs for you. So the, the other thing to take into account is the amount of packages that exist. How hard is it to find my one package out of that 21.5 billion? Um, you'd probably have a better chance at winning the Powerball, especially because I'm, I'm well aware of what you're looking for when it comes to a suspicious package. And my, none of my packages are ever gonna look that way. Um, and we compare them to some of the other shippers, and you can see the numbers are pretty drastic in, in terms of differences. 
Um, drug sniffing dogs, com compared to what like, a lot of people think, drug sniffing dogs, they don't work eight hour shifts. They, they're sporadic. Um, you can't work them like you could an Amazon employee. So, <laughs> um, so that's one thing. But then you take into account permeation, which is where a smell can go through an object. Um, all those things come into play. When I would ship, I would ship two to three day. Um, there's not enough time for it to come through vacuum sealed bags and um, a visual barrier in that amount of time. So on top of that, like when you get, when you, if your drugs do get intercepted, what happens is you, you get a notice and we call it a love letter and it comes from USPS typically or customs if it's an overseas order. And they just say that we've intercepted your drugs. They don't, they don't say it like that. They say we have your package please come to the post office and pick up your package. Once you show up with that letter, you're acknowledging that that's your package. Because aside from that, they can't prove it's yours. They can't, you didn't order this on Amazon. So there's, they can't hop on and see, you know, your credit, tra your credit card transaction um, where you bought these drugs. You bought it in Bitcoin or your Monero or, you know, any one of the available options that existed to you. So they rely on things like that. So, you know, your countermeasure uh, for when you get a love letter is to burn it or throw it away. Um, it's relevant. So the other thing that law enforcement likes to do on occasion um, is controlled deliveries. And controlled deliveries, a little bit more aggressive, obviously, than a love letter. But again, you have countermeasures for that as well. Um, you have no obligation to open your door for anyone. Um, and if they had, you know, even if it was the police, if they had, if they had permission to come into your house, they wouldn't be knocking, right? They'd be kicking in the door and they'd be coming in um, and they'd be taking you out. So it's all voluntary, um, you answering that door. And it's the same thing with delivery services. You can just not answer that door. Um, and a lot of the times darknet vendors are not going to require signature because it would be like, you know, requiring you to give your real name when you're using a handle as a hacker. It's just not something you're gonna do. If I ask you on an IRC chat, what's your real name and we just met, how willing are you gonna be to give that information over? Probably not likely. Um, so from that, there, there, there are countermeasures for it. So sometimes they'll put devices in the box and we'll just let the box sit for 24 hours or 48 hours or three days until the batteries in that device, if it's small, die. Or if they're using something local like a radio frequency, we travel, open the box up 10 miles away. Any transmitter they have in there would be well out of distance. So if you do it well, this is what they should know about you. It should be nothing. It should be, oh yeah, he's the computer guy So in making an image for yourself on the dark net, one of the best ways I found to do that was to be helpful. And, you know, just like on a social engineering campaign, if you're disingenuine, people pick that up very quickly. Um, it's like flattery. You know, a lot of times flattery has the opposite effect that you intended to have. So being disingenuous in the dark net is something that can be picked up by some people and a lot of people find it repulsive, just like you do in real life when someone compliments you for the fifth time on your shoes. So my move was to contribute 5,000 posts and I did that on Hansa in a month. And by doing that, basically everyone in that community now associates my name with good things, with helping out, with OPSEC, with you know, enjoying helping other people. Um, and that's the, the kind of the irony is everyone seems to think about the dark net as this horrible place where, you know, there's, you know, there are really bad things on there. It's not up for debate. But at the same time, not everyone on there is a psychopath, you know. Um, a lot of times it's just people. So with that, I was able to establish rapid rapport in that community. People knew me. And when someone came in there, just like any other community, if you come into any community and you start you know, threatening someone, or like, you know, if someone came in here and started saying a well-known speaker didn't know what he was talking about, the community would probably revolt against that. They wouldn't like that very much. 
Um, you have the same thing in the dark net. But instead of having that trust, you have that verification through things like PGP signatures and signed messages and all you know stuff like that. Uh, when we look at the history and the present and the future of reconnaissance and information gathering when it comes to law enforcement, there are a few different countermeasures a darknet vendor can take if he's informed, if he knows enough about it. Uh, my thing was to hop on Pacer. Like you might see the Department of Justice announce a darknet bust, but they don't really give you details. Pacer will. Pacer is the place where you can find federal cases. You can find the United States Attorney's wording and how they caught that person, uh, what that person did, where they screwed up. Again, if we can look and we can map out how they screwed up, we can make it so that we never screw up. We never make those same mistakes that our predecessors did. And we're playing, in this game, you're playing for keeps. You know, messing up here doesn't mean that, you know, this, this uh, particular assignment you have to go find another penetration testing engagement. It means that you're going to federal prison. So it's not something you want to screw up. Um, so tend to tread a lot more carefully, um, even when it comes to things like cashing out crypto or you know, making it so that the chain that law enforcement uses to trace you or trace your transactions is a lot harder to uncover. So, from what I've seen on the darknet, the majority of the time that darknet sites actually get taken down is not from law enforcement being highly talented. Um, it's from just a administrator making a stupid OPSEC mistake um, or not updating or getting complacent, right? Because we have that kind of sliding scale where we have complacency on one side and security on the other. And time seems to be a variable that wears that down to the other side where they become complacent. So Reddit ended up banning darknet markets and our response was to create Dread. Hugbunter is famously known as the one who created it. Um, he created it and he ended up making it and making it public as a replacement for darknet markets, which is a massive subreddit. Um, and their ban of it came out of nowhere. And what it did was it made it so that people on the clear net or people that weren't using Tor, it made them a lot harder to get their questions answered on how to navigate the darknet. Um, and that removal of information was a tactic used by law enforcement to try to stop people from using the darknet. Um, and that was our answer was dread, um, which I was an uh, administrator on. So when you get started, you want to look at a few different things. Your main goal, obviously, is to avoid incarceration, avoid arrest. Um, you want to create a secure persona. Um, sometimes it's good to create multiple personas um, and have them all age. Um, your ultimate goal is to not get arrested. And if you do screw something up, that's, that's what's going to happen. Um, you are successful as long as you're not in federal custody. Um, and once you are, it's far too late to go back. Uh, my suggestion is to map out and have responses to any type of incident that may occur. Just like a major company has security policies, you know, they set up and countermeasures set up to be able to handle anything that goes wrong. It's the responsibility of that person who's going to be, you know, dealing in transactions to make sure that they do the same. So some of the threats that exist um, are physical threats like DNA. Um, if that darknet vendor doesn't know anything about physical security or operational security um, or anything like that, he might assume that, you know, they're not going to go through the effort of, you know, looking for skin cells or analyzing a package heavily. Um, and the fact of the matter is, if you don't know it for sure, then you're always better erring on the side of caution. Um, noisy neighbors, and these kind of, you know, if you, have is if you have issues with your neighbors, they don't like you, that's an adversary, you know? Um, 
they can call up without even even a wellness check. You know, they can they can anyone can write an email to the FBI. You know, I see them come in with 20 packages a day. It's abnormal. It's a red flag. Um, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi attacks, all those things that we we know very well. You know, people in this con um, understand very well. Trash is another one. Uh, it's always better to shred it or burn it if possible. It's a lot of these same security measures that we take in this field, safeguarding corporations, are the things that you will see a responsible darknet vendor take. The only difference is instead of having teams do it and millions of dollars to do it, they're stuck trying to figure it out and do it all themselves. Which is why, and, and which, is, which is one of the things that creates that low hanging fruit for law enforcement. Those people who don't understand encryption or don't know fully about OPSEC, and maybe they're just drug traffickers. They don't have a background in that. Another thing is uh, linguistical anal uh, analytics. It's something I always try to keep mindful of. If I'm writing on the dark net, on a forum, I'm from New England, so we tend to say the word like wicked to, des to describe something as, as very. You know, so if I say this is a wicked good talk, it means it's a very good talk. Um, and with that said, if I use that terminology in a, in a forum and law enforcement picks that up, now they know, okay, this guy's from New England. Or they, you know, this guy's from Massachusetts. You know, they, 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 can, they can get detailed information on where I am based on that. And that's a threat. That's a problem. Um, and something that, again, a lot of people, they don't, they don't think about when they go into it. And there's no manual for this. You know, unlike the hacking culture, we've been around a long time. You know, it's a big culture, and the darknet culture isn't so much. It's a lot more secretive. What's interesting is everything I'm telling you today, all of this is freely available. You know, so if you're from the Department of Homeland Security and you're here hoping to learn some elite, you know, thing, it's just not going to happen. It's all publicly available to anyone who seeks this information. My internet service, when I was a darknet vendor, it didn't exist. Again, I drew, I drew a lot of my inspiration uh, from Kevin Mitnick. Um, I liked a lot of the stuff that he did. I thought a lot of his things were ingenious. And uh, along with those was something I borrowed, which is a little bit more localized than what he did with cell towers, was um, grabbing a Yagi and connecting to a neighbor's internet who I had no visual barriers to, meaning I could see his house, but it was far enough away for me to feel secure. So if I saw, you know, a bunch of black SUVs rolling up, I could assume it was safe to burn everything I had and get rid of everything, clean house, um, because my neighbor was getting raided. So one thing I would always check, I would do perimeter checks on a regular basis. Um, I was a homebody. I didn't like to leave. Um, I'm definitely not big on social interactions, personally. Uh, I think I have a little bit of agoraphobia. So this talk is extremely challenging for me. Um, however, I, it was something that I felt I would love to share. Um, and I'm glad that DEF CON gave me the opportunity to share it with you guys. Um, but one of the things that needs to be stayed on top of is security checks. Just like in a corporation, you constantly have to make sure that everyone's staying on point. Because again, complacency is the enemy of security. So that was one of the big things that I had. I had weekly, daily, and monthly checklists of things that I would make sure that I was doing. At the end of the day, we all feel safe. We, when we're at home, we all feel safe, we all feel secure, and then one day we lose our keys. And then all of a sudden, we're all penetration testers. We can look at our house and we can say, oh, I can card the door. Oh, I left that window open. Now all of a sudden, you can find three, four different vulnerabilities in your home. And you stop, you stop feeling so safe until you get those secured. Um, and I think that's something that, as, you know, as a darknet vendor, it's, it's very easy to get comfortable, just like it is for our average people. Checking out your weaknesses and making sure that they're fixed. Evaluating your OPSEC on a regular basis, to me, is mandatory, especially because the repercussions aren't a data breach, they're incarceration in a federal facility. Um, staying away from emotional decisions, um, things like drinking 
and typing will get you rated, will get you a 10 to 25 year sentence. So it's suicide, career suicide on a little bit of a different level than what we're used to. I like to always advise to never, never answer questions. Um, even to this day, I don't, uh, I will answer questions after this talk, but you know, like in general, <laughs> um, when it comes to law enforcement or obviously someone you don't know uh, calling up, you know, and asking you questions. And a really great, you know, thing to watch is to go to the SC Village and see people calling people up and those people just giving out information. Obviously, we all know it's not a good idea. Um, so I'm always leery of that. And uh, in turn, I always, I always like to answer that question with a question. So once you actually pull that trigger and you start being a darknet vendor and you start having to actually deal with customers, you have to write uh, terms and conditions. Um, you know, when are you gonna refund a customer? How long is it gonna go? How long are you gonna wait before, you know, if someone buys something from you today and tomorrow they say, hey, I want a tracking number, are you gonna give it to them? Should you give it to them? You know, if you give it to them, then they'll know where you ship that from. You know, maybe you want a little bit more time before you're willing to give that away. Um, so all those little kind of things are things that need to be seriously evaluated when you're considering building a, uh, a platform or when you're considering being a darknet vendor. <clears throat> Again, I have it as number six here, don't drink and type, it's essential. So changing your PGP key, not a lot of vendors do this. Um, but it lets you switch up. You switch up your identity, which means you, your reputation dies. And that's unfortunate. But you can always build that reputation back up and it'll take a massive target off your back. So your point of you doing this is to make money. That's how I saw it. Um, it was to make money, it was to get in, it was to get out. And that was my goal. So having that mapped out with your ingress, your egress, and your regress, as far as things like changing your PGP key or things like that, were essential to me before I started. And were things that I kept in mind during the whole time. Once you start building a reputation on the dark net, it's in spite or out. So what I mean by that is like, you as professionals right now, if you have, you work for a big company, Right? or you write a book, you're building a reputation. You can use that reputation to get a better job. And you can do the same thing on the dark net. Except instead of me offering a former employer might be a verifiable PGP signed message to a new employer. You know, a new dark net opens up and I message the admin and I say, hey, listen, I can help you out. I have these previous accounts. I can validate them. You can check them. And I can prove that I've done this kind of work before. And it allows you again to spider out and end up getting multiple different jobs, um, which pay sometimes a lot better than if you're just starting out as a vendor. Um, that reputation is something you can buy and you can sell and you can trade on. Um, and your, you know, your PGP key, your identity is much more restricted. And it's restricted to darknet market admins as opposed to all the users. So me personally, I hate Bitcoin tumblers. I never use them. Um, I, I just didn't like them. I don't like sending my Bitcoin to someone and I don't know who they are. It always kind of rubbed me the wrong way. So what I used to do is I used to convert it from Bitcoin to Monroe and then back to Bitcoin. And I was happy with that because I knew that the link between the two different types of Bitcoin that I had was completely broken. It's kind of like robbing a bank and buying a bunch of weed and selling all that weed. And now the money that you have is completely different. Whether or not you made money on it is a different fact. Um, Alternatively, um, also buying drugs. 
So if I sold $20,000 worth of narcotics in three days, I could turn around and I could buy narcotics and I could sell them locally at a much steeper markup and still have anonymity. So then you get to retirement. If you make enough, you know, if you're lucky enough, you get to this point. Um, and surprisingly, a lot of people, I've known a lot of dark net vendors who have gotten to this point. They say like drug dealers, don't get to retire. Well, dark net vendors do, and I've known a couple of them. It's completely possible. Um, I'm not encouraging anyone to do it. If you're at this con, you're obviously intelligent. I suggest that you don't do it because it has horrible ROI and it's a lot of stress. And you know, I'm 37. Look at all the gray hair I have. You know, um, it's not an easy job. Um, so I don't recommend it to anyone, and that's one thing I, I definitely like to make clear. Um, so yeah, I talk about here that you know we do switch up switch up PGP keys. Uh, again, that kills kills all your business, but that's it's a necessary. Um, so when my Department of Justice announcement came out, where they announced me and uh, the, about 33 other people that got raided, um, they said that it was because of Operation Dark Gold. And I'm from Vermont. You can see the little arrow going up north from. Uh, well, maybe you can't. Yeah, you probably can't on the screen. I'm sorry about that. Um, but. That's what they claim. Basically, Operation Dark Gold was they caught someone who was laundering Bitcoin um, and they had this guy continue to do it. And people would cash out their Bitcoin to him for 10% and he would send them cash in the mail. Um, at this time, KYC, the Know Your Customer Policy for Bitcoin, wasn't really prevalent um, and it only applied to banking institutions at that point. So personal Bitcoin transactions are not illegal. Um, and, you know, quoting, trying to say that because someone bought Bitcoin from someone, this was how you caught them. To me, I thought it was asinine because it made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Um, to me, it was just a way to collect names of people who were on the dark net. Um, and that's exactly what they did. Uh, that, that was, but that was how they said that they ended up catching me. Um, the issue that I had with that was that at the end of the day, you have a hearing called the Franks hearing uh, in law. And a Franks hearing is when you can prove that law enforcement violated the law in order to catch you doing something or to get a warrant to search your house. Um, they themselves broke the law in trying to ascertain that information. That was my case. The United States Postal Inspector opened a package that he didn't have a warrant for. Again, one of my favorite reasons why I use the United States Postal Service was it requires a warrant for you to open a package. And this went back to my OPSEC and they broke that. But in breaking that, they also gave me a way to exit out of my 10 count federal indictment that they also hit me with because they broke the law. We didn't get to that point. Um, and that was because before we could bring that up, after our Franks hearing was granted, my cousin had already written a statement which established conspiracy. And the feds can give you a mandatory minimum for a conspiracy charge. It can be anywhere from 10 years to 20 years. So it's not something that you really want to take a gamble with. So after I was caught, um, I was convicted, um, but only after I pled out. I agreed to a maximum term of 108 months in federal prison, and I was actually given 60 months, which is awesome. I, was, I thought it was awesome, because then I didn't know anything about the federal system. When I first got charged, I had a 10 count indictment. When I looked up those charges, I saw each one came with a maximum of 20 years. We do the math, that's 200 years. So that's what I thought I was gonna get. I thought, well, I'm gonna get 200 years. I'm never gonna get out of prison, which, it was, it, it just, it's not how it works in the federal system. So I studied law for 18 months while I was in federal prison because I inherently, I saw a lot of power in it. Just like a lot of you see a lot of power in learning how to code. Those things allow you to do things that, you know, the person who doesn't know how to code, maybe not, they can't do, or they can't automate or they can't get as much done as you can. 
Um, so for me, the code I wanted to learn was federal law, and that's what I learned. And by doing that, I was able to get myself out of prison. They have a thing called a compassionate release where, you know, if you can prove that there's a danger from, you know, because of your health, then you can apply for compassionate release. And I did. I wrote a 200 page motion and I mailed it in to the federal court. So that was essentially my brute force attack to the federal courts and it worked um, and they released me. But it was after a, a lot of studying, uh, a lot of hours, a lot of 12 hour days reading federal law. Uh, so this year, DEF CON's theme is hacker homecoming. And uh, for me, that's especially true. Um, technically, my release date is for the third day in January of 2023. Um, so I'm very happy to be here standing on the stage talking to all of you, as opposed to being in a prison cell. So I made a stupid mistake and I got, I got myself in trouble and I paid the consequence for what I did. Um, but at the same time, that hacker mentality of never giving up, of always wanting to fight and just continually bashing your head against that wall, um, it ended up paying off in a, in a totally different way than a lot of us see on a regular basis. You know, um, it wasn't that that code finally ran without crashing. It was that, you know, I wasn't stuck in a, a small cell with a bunch of sociopaths, um, you know, who have life sentences. So that was, that was a great thing. Um, but it's one of the things that really made me appreciate both communities because I started out in the hacking community and I ended up going into the dark net community because it's such an easy transition. You know, you, one of the most paramount things is understanding security and being in this field, you already do that. And that's, I think that's the really dangerous thing that exists is because it's so easy to just move over to that side. You know, uh, for me, I was anyways. So in conclusion, you know, moving over from that from, from being a hacker to being a dark net vendor, um, it was ridiculously easy. But again, you know, you don't, you can have the perfect OPSEC and still get fucked over and get fucked up. Um, you know, you, there's no such thing. We all know there's no such thing as an unpickable lock, right? There's no such thing as a foolproof plan. There's no security application that we can install that's going to make us all safe, guaranteed. Um, it's the same thing, no matter what side of the, that fence you're on, whether it's law enforcement or, you know, criminal. But thank you for letting me speak here. I think uh, they're going to open it up for Q&A, if you guys have any questions. Yeah, can I use this one? I, I can get a field mic if you want. All right, either way. Yeah, I'm fine with this one. Just have them raise your hand. All right. Questions? Anyone? Should I use more than one sock puppet? What's that? Should I use more than one sock puppet? Should you use more than one sock puppet? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone else? If you have a question, come on up here. So how did you originally find out about uh, the darknet markets and what all markets did you operate on? Um, so I operated on probably a total of about 15 different markets. Um, I remember the first time I really heard about Bitcoin um, was from a friend of mine and he was discussing how there's a site called BTC Faucet, which used to exist back in the day where like you could hop on once a day and you get anywhere from like five to 50 Bitcoin. 
Um, and we'd, we'd done that a bunch of times. And then I got to a point where we had like 300 Bitcoin and we were like, this is a waste of time. This is crap. You know, we just threw away the wallets. <laughs> Big time regret there. Yes. Oh yeah, 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 yep, yep. We sold them too. <laughs> yep. Hey, so you talked a lot about like operational hygiene and stuff like that relating to sorry, like oh, I can't uh, hear you. okay. So like you talked a lot about like operational hygiene. So like in um, in a week or in a month, you had like these routines and things you would do to try to like promote like a good good like. Sick, uh, sec ops like hygiene, right? To I make sure. I can't, I can't make out. Okay. Saying. Sorry, I can't. <laughs> um, uh, so, for things like you, you have like, um, uh, is, is there any strategy you would use specifically for like trying to determine what your weakest points are for trying to, like, trying to establish a, a good, hey, this is what I'm going to check this week, right? Because you can't check everything. You can't check every failure point, every right. area. What, what kind of things would you specifically look for as part of like, your strategy to protect yourself uh, OPSEC-wise? Yep. So initially, I spent six months doing research, um, looking at previous cases where the feds had raided people, why they had raided them, and that, that was kind of my starting point for that. And then once you start to grasp that, you start finding your own little hacks and things that you can do to make it improved. Yep. So, but to answer your question, it was mainly um, history, right? Because history predicts the future. So I would try to look at what happened in the past to evaluate what was going to happen or what I would need to do to evolve and not be the guy in that DOJ announcement. You have time for about two more questions. Hey, um, you said you would burn identities with some regularity um, to not leave any tracks about who you were. Did you ever get caught on any of these markets by people you interacted with as being somebody on a different market using a different identity and if you did did that cause any issues so I, I heard the first part of it what was the second part did you ever get caught using multiple identities on a number of these different websites by people you interacted with whether it be other staff other users um, for being you know a vendor under different names yeah so um so you see it's, it's interesting because once you're there for so long in like that kind of anonymous environment, you can start to see people's mannerisms. It's a lot like um, with 4chan, right? When you, start having, you started having people who would use the same kind of terminology or wording, you could tell who's who. Even if their name changes 50 times, you still know that person because you spent a lot of time talking to them. You know their, idea, their ideals or their politics or whatever it is that they're discussing. Um, so those things, that, using the, using your identity for other things, um, to me it, would, it wouldn't be something that, I, I wasn't really there um, for the socialization aspect, you know, I was there strictly to make money and anything that helped further that goal, I would be there. So when it did come to having to establish an identity and, you know, just make a ridiculous amount of posts to the community, that's what I would use it for, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it anywhere else. I actually, I remember reading a case about a darknet vendor who had his PGP key on the darknet and then the idiot decided to use that as his Gmail PGP key, you know, and he didn't last too long. <laughs> All right. Interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I was wanting to get your thoughts on like um, some markets had exit scams and kind of what was involved in that process were mods behind it and this also the second question is um, the DDoS attacks on a lot of markets is that re really revenue depleting for them or money losing did they pay off the DDoS people to stop that happen so I've seen uh, really to answer, to answer the second question real quick the um, I think the primary motive that you see for DDoS's um, when it comes to darknet markets is mainly um, federal agencies. Um, it's like, well, how can you prove that? Well, you can't, you know. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but really, it's, it's one of the only ways that you can really see them take down markets um, with any kind of regularity. But even then, you know, they just create new URLs and good luck, they move on. Um, but aside from that, um, I've known darknet uh, market admins who have wanted to conduct those campaigns against competing 
um, darknet markets. Hi, um, can you can you uh, explain if and why certain drugs or pharmaceuticals aren't as targeted? Um, I explain as why. in uh, like for example. Um, like health wellness drugs or something like that as opposed to like cocaine or heroin. Um, and then also it kind of ties in with my follow-up question, but um, what goes into the ability for someone to order internationally from like a drugstore internationally and why is that legal um, to import certain drugs when you don't have a prescription? Um, do you know anything about that? So, um, one of one of the more lucrative trades that I found when I was doing it was just that was to do retail. So, you have a lot of people who aren't comfortable ordering internationally uh, because internationally is when it goes through customs. If I'm sending you any kind of narcotic through the mail here in the U.S., it doesn't go through customs. Um, so, there's not a whole bunch of scrutiny. So, it's fairly easy to do that, but. When it goes through customs, it's a little bit more. Um, so I know that one of the things I started doing after a while was looking at which countries would produce the best of a certain type of drug. So for example, um, LSD. Um, there's a vendor, and again, this isn't a secret, it's very well known, uh, called Gamma Goblin, who makes some of the best LSD that exists. and. Um, he lives in the Netherlands. That's where he's located out of. If you get a package from him, that's where it's gonna come from, um, sometimes. But the Netherlands is, is really known for having good quality LSD and good quality MDMA. So for me, I would source the countries that had the best quality and then I would find vendors in that because you can always, you can, you can refine those search parameters in almost any dark net market. And then with that information, I would go and I would look on sites like Dread and I would cross-reference and find their reputation, find out what people said about them. So I would find the countries that had the best of a certain type of drug, then I would find the guy in that country who has the highest reputation in marketing that drug, and I would order it from him. And like, you know, sometimes the profit margins would be insane. Like I know uh, with acid from Gamma Goblin, I could grab it for about five cents a hit and sell it for about 10 to 15. Um, Locally, on the dark net, it would usually be around four, but again, it was still an astronomical return. I'm on investment, and with something like acid, it's a piece of paper. There's no smell to it. So, it's very easy to do. Last question. Last question. Hi, uh, what platforms did you use to launder the Bitcoin to Monero, and then how did you vet those platforms? So, when I did it, the, the one thing I'd, I'd like to remind you is, like, when I was doing all this, it was years ago, um, so originally, it was Changely. Um, I really liked Changely. Um, there's another one, Shapeshift.io. Any service that I would use, I would try to investigate them as much as I could. Um, and I had learned that Shapeshift was really open to um, the DOJ, and I just wasn't for that. I didn't really see too much about Changely, um, so I liked, I liked using them. But again, like any time I would visit their site, it's gonna be through Tor anyway, you know? Thank you.